uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, are you eager to transform your legacy application to a modern microservice-based architecture, but uh, having problem finding appropriate RESTful framework to cover your client, server, or documentation, or service discovery needs? Then this may be the right place for you. Resli, I'm going to talk about today, may be the answer for you. Resli is a RESTful service architecture developed at LinkedIn and open sourced it. Uh, together with this powerful ecosystem tools, we have successfully transformed the linking from a legacy application to a modern service-oriented architecture at a scale with thousands of uh, services that are rapidly growing. Before RESTly was born, like all many other organizations, linking is also have this monolithic layered architecture. With service explosion and quick iteration, the shortcoming of this architecture become more and more obvious. For example, we have a complex orchestration and a complex dependency from the service explosion. Of course, never to mention constant integration test failure due to backward incompatibility. Finally, it turns out we have very slow rollout for every feature. It's time for us to consider a paradigm shift to a modern microservice-based architecture. For this paradigm shift, we have set high expectations to not repeat previous mistake. First, we would like to have fine-grained service boundary. And also, we want to have backward compatible service evolution. And never to mention, we actually want to enable standard service access pattern for service integration to ease big organization migration. And the final goal we want to achieve is continuous delivery. However, to meet such high expectation, there are several challenges. First, we would like to define a standard way to describe your service in a service-oriented architecture. We also want to enable standard access pattern by diverse client written in multiple different languages. Thirdly, we want our solution to be asynchronous and scalable. Many of our services receive requests, uh, thousands of requests per second per instance. We want our solution to be able to work under such heavy load. Fourthly, we want to ensure writing API is fast and easy for server developer or client developer, even though they are not REST developers. And finally, we want to support long-term service evolution and growth. That's where REST come into picture. RESTly was developed by LinkedIn and open source in 2012. It played a secret weapon for us to migrate from monolithic architecture to a data model-centric microservice-based architecture in LinkedIn. So what is RESTly then? Simply put, RESTly is a REST framework and built by uh, LinkedIn and open source, as I mentioned. It allows you to build robust and scalable RESTful architecture using asynchronous and non-blocking I.O. It fills a niche by, for applying RESTful principles at scale with an end-to-end developer workflow that promote clean REST practice. Here, I particularly highlight two key points here, clean REST practice and a scalable open source. I will elaborate these two highlights, which differentiate RESTful framework from other REST framework on the market. So first, Clean REST practice. There's a famous Chinese uh, proverb, nothing can be accomplished without norm and standard. This is particularly true for building a large-scale infrastructure. RESTly aims to set this norm and standard for, by promoting a clean REST practice from three aspects. First, end-to-end -end developer workflow. Second, online API hub for API documentation and the service catalog. Thirdly, we want to enable capability checker enabled API evolution. So let's first talk about what is a developer workflow when you're using a RESTly to develop your application. First, you start by defining your data model. Consistent data modeling is always a big key for us to achieve data model-centric microservice architecture. In RESTly framework, you define your data model using our Pegasus data schema language. We call it PDSC. This Pegasus data schema language is inspired by Apache Avro specification with a JSON serialization format. 
It provides rich type support, like a record, enum, union, array, map, etc. Also support custom types. For example, this is a simple data schema file to represent a data model called a photo, because I will use that as an example later on for the photo endpoint. OK, after you define your data model, Thrashly framework will automatically generate a language specific module like a class we call record template. Record template serves as a source of truth of the data model bindings between your client and the server. Now, server developer is ready to provide your resource class. You need to implement your REST resource and provide what operation you want to support it. Restly intended to foster a uniform interface design. It's just this uniform interface design making your develop your REST resource like a breeze for non-expert as well. In the Restly framework, we provide a set of standard resource patterns. We also categorize typical REST operations into some uniform service interface, like a CRUD, Finder, Actions, Batch. Finally, your service resource contract is formally communicated through a standard interface description language file we call REST spec IDL. So in REST framework, there are four resource patterns you can define for your resource. Each REST endpoint can be one of these four types. First, a collection resource type is used to model a key value mapping of entities. And a simple resource is to capture a singleton in a certain scope. Association you can use to model a relationship between your entities. And the final reaction is used to accommodate if you want to define some non-standard REST operations. In addition, in addition, each resource can be a larger child resource or a larger resource point to model your parent child relationships. So resource is a noun in the REST world. And resource method is a verb in the REST world. And the REST provides out of the box some standard resource method that capture your typical REST operation, like a create, get, update, partial update, delete, finder action, etc. Note that this verbs are a little bit different from the HTTP verb we normally familiar with, like a post, get, delete, and put. But they have one-to-one -one mapping with them to send to the re uh, send a request to your over the wire. Besides this basic resource method, we also provide a batch version about this resource method for you to reduce round trip to your server. For example, server developer can use this batch method to improve performance optimization. For example, you can do the cache, you can do the database batch query. OK, now with all this resource pattern and resource methods standardized, what server code do you need to write? Pretty simple. You only need to find what resource template you want to extend it for your resource and implement those resource methods you want to support. When you implement those resource methods, remember to use those POJO-like record template class we generated for you to take as a parameter and return as a result. After you implement the resource class, and the REST framework will automatically build a REST spec file for your service contract to share with you with your client. This resource contact, uh, re this IDL file is a language agnostic JSON file format. For example, this is a photo endpoint uh, I, I just implement. This is a service contract demonstrated about the, this endpoint. This IDL file, together with your data model schema file, you defined in step one, PDSE file, this serves as your service metadata. This service metadata can be dynamic queried from your service endpoint through an options call. OK, last step in the server development. You only left with create your server application, mostly leverage to using a REST classes to initialize and configure your REST server. Then your server application is up. Now let's move to the client development. Based on the REST spec IDL file, Restly will generate a class called Request Builders. These Request Builders, together with the record template we generated earlier, provide a convenient and type-safe way for client developer to send a Restly request to your server. 
So let's see what client developer need to write. When you, for example, you just introduce a photo endpoint I talked earlier, you implement a create operation for your endpoint. A client developer need to create a new photo for your endpoint. So to perform this operation, client developer just need to write such code. First step, using those strong typed generated data model class to create a new photo object by setting all this attribute. Next, we use this type saved request builder we generated to create your create request. By this strong typed data model and type safe request builder, we hide the low level protocol detail from you. The client developer quite easy to make this valid request without worry about all the syntax of the curve. Last but not least, by combining REST spec IDL and data schema PDSE file, RESTNI framework can automatically generate a human readable documentation, which can be dynamic query from your service endpoint. RESTNI framework will also use this uh, human readable documentation to do comparison checking and to figure out the backward compatibility. So up to this point, I have finished the end-to-end -end developer workflow. In this workflow, only the blue box here is the code you need to write. All the other component is dynamic generated by RESTI framework. Throughout this end-to-end -end developer flow, we are striving to standardize developer practice by consistent data modeling, uniform interface design, and type-saved client binding. To foster collaboration across service communication, an online service catalog become an indispensable part to smooth your integration. RESTI API Hub is a web UI for you to search a broad uh, catalog of RESTI APIs. So it provides several important features. First, you have this Lucene powered full text search with detailed data model and interface documentation. It also helps you to generate a sample request and play lively with your real RESTI endpoint. Last, in the clean REST practice is server backward compatibility. So in the REST, REST forward, the API is level static. You have to evolve based on the business needs. This may bring a lot of integration friction if not done properly. REST provides the build time compatibility checkers. It actually provides you a compatibility report for your data model and service contract to API developer before real deployment so that you can know whether your change will break existing client or not. This compatibility checker can be done based on your configuration. We support various configurations. You can specify equivalent backward. You even can turn it off if you are sure your change will not break your existing client. So next, I want to talk about the second high level of the RESTI framework, that's a skill and open. This one, we need to dial a little bit into the RESTI server stack. So RESTly server stack consists of three layers. First layer, RESTly layer. It is include data model layer and RESTful operation you expose through your uniform interface. It is Java library based on the inversion of a control. It actually hide all the, it's doing all the client server interaction and data flow behind the scenes and call the code you provided at the proper time. Second layer, D2 layer, dynamic discovery and load balancing. This layer is optional for your small service, but will provide fault tolerance scalability for a large scale infrastructure service like LinkedIn. The bottom layer is R2 layer. R2 layer is our transport layer abstraction to capture lateral communication. It provides high performance async and long blocking I.O. So actually, I have talked a lot about the REST layer before in explained end-to-end -end developer workflow. Next, I want to show you how we achieve scalability through our R2-D2 layer. So what is R2? R2 stands for request and response. It is a Java library to abstract message style communication over the HTTP. It provides high performance asynchronous API with non-blocking back pressure support. So we would like to achieve a streaming model on the right here where the body of the request and the body of response can be processed one chunk at a time instead of fully buffered bytes. 
So this one is done through our entity stream API in our R2 layer. D2 is called a dynamic discovery built based on the Apache Zookeeper. By dynamic discovery, what, what I meant is that in your server code, in your code, you don't need to actually hard code your server URL in your code. You only need to specify what service you need to talk to. And D2 will automatically convert into a server URL and dedicate to the red host to handle it. So in the D2 layer, we use Zookeeper as a registry for information about all the available service and what host that can serve those service. So by grouping servers into clusters and also by dynamic discovery shutdown and uh, announcement through the Zookeeper firmware nodes, we can achieve client-side load balancing by distributing evenly to the host. Also, we can provide fault tolerance by reduced load to the overloaded uh, servers. In addition, we also can handle the backward request to improve the tail latency. RESTly defined its own over-the-wire protocol, but we hide its over-the-wire protocol through a RESTly client framework. Apart from the type-saved data model and request builder I mentioned earlier, the core of RESTly client framework is the RESTly client interface with its pluggable transport client. RESTly client interface is used to implement and interpret RESTly protocol and then delegate it to the pluggable transport client to send HTTP requests to the server and receive HTTP response from server. This diagram and shows a high-level view of interaction and data flow between a RESTly client and a server through our three-layer stack. So the yellow arrow indicate requests coming out of from the RESTly client into the server and the dark blue error indicated response from the server back to the client. As an open source project, we are always striving to pro provide great room for customization and extension. In the RESTly framework, we provide three extension points for you to do the customization. First is the filter chain pipeline. RESTly provides ways for you to intercept incoming requests and outgoing response through filters. And filters contains method for you to handle res both response and request. Filter can be done in two levels, either at the RESTly, le RESTly level, where you want to deal with all the data models, or you can done in the R2 layer, you, where you only deal, de deal with the bytes. The second extension point is the polyglot transport client. R2 only provides abstraction for the message style communication. Default out of box, we provide Netty client implementation and also Jetty serverlet. Of course, you can freely plug into your own transport client implementation and also serverlet container into the framework without any problem. The third extension point is custom codec. In RESTly out of box, we provide JSON and PSON content encoding, but we provide a mechanism for you plugging your own custom codec to encode or decode request response in your preferred format, for example, XML. Building a large-scale application is uh, cannot limit to just sending individual requests to the server. Most time, you need to deal with a lot of heterogeneous subsystems written in completely different languages. Sometimes, you need to also compose several uh, data models from different endpoints to build a presentable view for your application. Other time, you need to send a bunch of downstream calls, use some sequential parallel fashions with complicated workflow dependency. That's why we have built some rich ecosystem tools around the RESTly to help you to do this work. In this talk today, I want to mention three important ecosystems we built around the RESTly. One is DECO, the other Parsec, and second, third one is multi-language support. So what is DECO? DECO comes from the name decoration. It is a Java library for projecting field and fetching intercollected resources for your using a specified query. DECO is designed to allow users to describe what data you want. Let DECO worry about how to fetch them from different cloud resources. Here demonstrate a real uh, perfect scenario There, DECO was used in LinkedIn to show a post created by a LinkedIn member here. 
To show this post by a Linkedin member, we need to make three service calls to three different endpoints, profile, company, and post. Somehow, massage this data from these three endpoints into a presentable view to show to you. We use that. We fetch this data through a special query language called a DECO recipe. In this case, this is a DECO recipe we use to fetch all data to display in the post. In this DECO recipe, we use projection to choose selected field. We use a decoration to decorate a certain field like author. We also use in foreign key resolution to figure out the company where the author is in. These three important features build the foundation for us to do normalized domain modeling instead of to duplicate the denormalized data modeling to avoid data redundancy. Next, I want to introduce you to another powerful ecosystem tool we built around the recipe called Parsec, which is also open source and wide adopted in LinkedIn in both front end and meteor services. This is a Java library to make programming asynchronous Java much easier. It is a well known fact that writing asynchronous Java code is tricky and challenging. It is not, sometimes it's at a Unimaginary complexity, not due to your business logic complexity, but due to because the asynchronous mechanism provided by your Java language. You know, sometimes your asynchronous oper operation can finish in different orders because underlying operation can finish in very amount of time. This is very amount of time, not sometimes due to expected course, like because you are doing long time consuming operation or fetching more data. But sometimes maybe due to some unexpected course like garbage collection or server load. This makes the asynchronous code very hard to debug and testing. Also bring a lot of non-determinism to your code. Developer need to worry about thread safety and a coordinated callback in a different thread is quite challenging. It's very hard to achieve all async code flow. So that's why to address all this problem, we built Parsec to make programming in Java, like asynchronous programming in Java, much easier. In the Parsec framework, we introduce four major concepts. First, promise. Promise representing a state of asynchronous operation. It's also a container for the result of your asynchronous operation. And the main abstraction unit in the Parsec is called a task. Task represented an asynchronous operation. The main ingredient of a task is his callable. The callable starts asynchronous operation and immediately return a promise representing this operation state. Finally, Parsec engine serves as a harness to run your task. So Parsec programming model is declarative and functional. People using Parsec to write their code is focused on what you want to achieve using functional programming not how you achieve it. And the Parsec API provides a very developer-friendly API for you to coordinate your async operations through task creation, parallel sequential task composition and chaining, and task transformation and error handling. Finally, it ends up with one root task. Internally, we represent as execution plan. We submit it to Parsec engine to execute. There's an important uh, things in the Parsec execution model. Parsec execution model maintain a very important environment. Actually, it's this important environment that frees server any developer from worry about all this asynchronous concern, concern about synchronous block or thread safety, Java memory model, etc. What this environment is saying is that all task callables are executed sequentially, such that callable of a previous task always happens before a callable of a next task. This happens before concept. It's the same definition defined in Java memory model. The task callable here, I show an example to show what is task callable here. This is a parsec task to sending a REST request. The highlighted red box is the callable for this task. So parsec provides a seamless integration with REST. REST framework have a resource template that support resource method can re directly return a Parsec task. Also, Parsec REST client provide APIs for you to create tasks from a REST request. So that's why they work so, 
seamlessly together. Another powerful feature in Parsec is its built-in trees and visualization. This actually is very important for the service monitoring and observation. Um, it provides a powerful tools for us debugging programmatic application flow. In addition, it provides performance metric for each step in your application flow, as shown show in the box here. To promote clean REST practice to heterogeneous system and diverse client, we are striving to expanding our multi-language support beyond Java. So besides Java desktop support, we also provide support for the Android Java, Object C, Swift for iOS client, we have a Python server client binding, also C sharp binding for developing .NET applications. To show the parity of a uh, RESTly framework, I have compared RESTly with some uh, typical on the market RESTful framework like uh, Jersey, Drop Wizard, Apache Olingo that's using their own data protocol. Um, I haven't picked all of them, but I think they all look like similar. I tried to compare them from several aspects I mentioned earlier data modeling, and the service server coding uh, easiness, the URL pattern standardization, batch service metadata support, do they have a dynamic service load balance support, online documentation, server catalog, graph query support. So you can look later on detail about their difference. Some covered, some maybe not covered, some half covered. So that's give you some parity. So RESTful framework have been proving to create a robust RESTful service architecture that can work at a scale with its wide adoption in LinkedIn and Coursera. There are still some interesting items in our roadmap. Um, here's some uh, roadmap I list here. In the REST layer, we would like to support object streaming and unstructured data support. And for the multi-language support, we want to enhance it to include the Go language. Also, we are thinking to propose a cross-language test suite for anybody to easily add a lot of different language binding. And we are attempting to open source our DECO library to enhance RESTly with more powerful graph query capability. Lastly, in the Parsec, we are planning to provide um, developer-friendly collection of APIs. Also, we want to empower our Parsec trees with intelligent data analytics uh, using machine learning. So here are some useful links for you to dig more if you're interested. This is all in the GitHub uh, open source project here. Um, so we are looking forward to contribution from audience today. Thank you very much for your attention here. So can okay, we have some time for questions? Yep, well, straight away. Thank you for the great talk. How do you guys evolve uh, the API? How do you manage versioning? Uh, in the home design, actually, RESTful framework, we're thinking about from the current developer friendly point. So we didn't put in the URI the version number in the URI. Instead, we're thinking, so if you introduce a different version, we actually think in the resource, like name, we use a suffix to indicate, like you have a photo. Then you want to evolve, you have a convention to do photo V2 or V3, something like that. And because we hide all the URL, the type secret request paper will already hide this detail for you. We can automatically generate it. If you use a version, developer have to branch your uh, source code into a different branch. And it's hard for them to share some resource they actually didn't version. Like we 2 I also work, work with own version of other resource. It's pretty complicated for the developer uh, user experience. That's why we decide to use the suffix convention. So resource level version? Yeah. Oh. I was quite intrigued as to <coughs> what was the idea behind open sourcing it. I would imagine there was a massive amount of work to go from internal framework to, I took a look at it yesterday, quite a polished open source product. What was the driver for LinkedIn to do that? Um, because I think in LinkedIn, after we do this uh, analytic migration, we found this framework is quite powerful for the service monitoring and 
big large organization because you have a different team to work together. You cannot be, have the same group to talk to each other on their contract. So we think it's quite valuable to open source to benefit every uh, the community. We spend a lot of effort actually to open source because initially everything is uh, internal. You know, all the way you have to move from internal to to open source GitHub. We have to constantly to um, actually maintain some active user from the community, their questions, each request. But I think it's their beneficial to, uh, to let people to know this framework, to get used to it, and help us improve that better and, uh, to, for building any service-oriented architectures. And then on the, our user member go to the, the Coursera, they feel, OK, they start building a Coursera infrastructure from scratch. They found, oh, this is quite useful. They build it quite quickly. That's uh, also motivated us to open source it. Okay, thanks. It seems like um, quite a, an extensive framework you've built there to support the development of microservices at your organization. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what kind of uh, lift in terms of productivity you got from your developers once you introduced this and everybody sort of uh, learned it and started using it. Oh, um. As I mentioned, there's a history before that. We have this uh, monolithic layer, the client uh, server architecture. That's get to a point where our rollout feature is pretty slow. And uh, then the management decide, OK, we use one quarter to phrase any new feature development and focus on to make this tool better for the for improved for development productivity. That's why we focus on to build this framework and then roll out to all the companies. Across companies, this is a horizontal initiative. Every service trying to migrate to this one. And actually, quite easy for them to migrate. That's, as you can see, because we thinking keep through all the different new features. And we quickly find this to make it beneficial for this migration, because nowadays, we actually running 2,000, 3,000 recipe service, service inside the LinkedIn data center. We also actually moved to the recipe practice to, <coughs> to the LinkedIn new mobile app. Just, uh, uh, just one year ago, because all the mobile, Android, uh, iOS, all use the same backend. <coughs> then they use the same practice everywhere. And uh, our data center serves requests uh, very high QPS every day. So, so that's so quite, uh, quite developer friendly from our internal developer. Almost, uh, I think, uh, except maybe very low, a very small service, they are still in a very legacy RPC one. We used to be RPC. And now almost our 95% service are ready in the interest. So do you have an idea if um, you know the like developer productivity say doubled once oh. you went to this new architecture? Uh, we didn't have a, do this kind of a metric, um, quantitative metric of measurement, but I think it definitely doubled or tripled compared to previous feature rollout speed. Great, thank you very much. Just in case we take back to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can, I, any detailed question we have, I can set up an office hour in Thursday, one o'clock. So I was curious, obviously with this framework there's a lot of abstraction, and usually with each level of abstraction you kind of add a little bit of delay. So what kind of performance are you seeing from this? Oh, we actually did performance measurement for this one. Um, because all this uh, streaming API, we introduced asynchronous, pure asynchronous non-blocking API. Our performance is per actually great. We measured always uh, for uh, the performance most part is hanging on the service logic you implement. When you implement the, the resource measure, if you are doing some simple plain, uh, simple operations, the, the performance we get is uh, always less than, uh, it's around one millisecond, that range. So the performance overhead is pretty small. That's why we actually very careful when we design the R2 layer. The R2 layer is very important because you don't want to block anything. You don't want to have a blocking, uh, like blocking API everywhere we try to be passive. One other question. Is it the to R2 layer are the mandatory um, so, uh, the detail on the R2 layer that you're explaining, are they mandatory or is RESTly something that could be deployed without um, these layers? So, I mentioned uh, in the slide, D2 is optional. D2. D2 is optional because 
if you are doing a startup smaller service to do a prototyping, initially you don't need to deploy D2 because you don't have, to have large scale. But for a large service infrastructure in LinkedIn, we actually want to have a robustness and scalability. For example, scale, so D2 provide a valuable uh, value to us because we, we can easily to do quarantine of some bad host and uh, doing the hash rate to a consistent distributed host, uh, the request to a healthy host. We also do the backward, backup request to try to do the retry for the healthy host and improve the PO latency. So it's quite useful for us to do the fault tolerance and scalability. But it's definitely optional for if you want to do uh, we have our own service mesh. Yeah, because all you can use your own yeah. into service discovery because they have very defined interface. But R2 is definitely the lesson because that's our foundation there to send requests. Um, but you can plug into your own client. You don't need to use many clients. We all of us provide a letter client and a JT server. You can use your Tomcat as so forth and uh, use your different client like a mobile. We, we used to also try to use Wally as their transport. Yeah, I see you use Zookeeper for service discovery. Do you have functionality there so people can swap out for other um, mechanisms, like console or something like that, for service discovery? Uh, Zookeeper. Uh, so we use Zookeeper only to define uh, some key memory interface. So in that key memory interface, it stores the registry to show this service map to a certain host, right? I think as long as you implement this interface, and we should be able to use, also use your uh, discovery library. But uh, I think Apache Jupyter is a popular mm -hmm. library in that sense, the usage we use. Also, the informer load is quite suitable for your dynamic server uh, startup and uh, shutdown. That could be your first contribution to Kubernetes. Quite a discovery. So how would you characterize uh, the relationship between Restly and Spring? Uh, cooperative, coexisting, or competing? <laughs> so I think we share a lot of a common concept there. Um, we, I think we are both RESTful framework, but I think Restly has their own ecosystem. Um, we actually, inside LinkedIn, we have to build our own um, for the dependency injection framework. So not like a spring, I know they have their spring. We actually have a what we call offspring <laughs> to do this uh, injection. Because the spring, as you use, people uh, have problems, especially for the uh, new developers, they're not familiar with the spring. It's very hard when they have something wrong because all the message stack trees is the same. They are to figure out where it's wrong. And we developed on um, the RESTI framework, developed another offspring framework to help people when something cannot be initialized, injected, it show the Java stack trace. So just purely from the developer perspective. I think so far we have to say those two frameworks have to coexist and uh, depend on your use case or which one more easy to, to support your scenario. Okay, thank you very much. Fantastic talk.